How you going guys? Dean from Blog for the Blood God here and I'm super excited to showcase the new Blog for the Blood God studio. We've just finished setting up, we've still got a few bits and pieces to work out, but fuck it, I'm excited and I want to show you guys around and also discuss some of the plans we have for the future. Alright, let me give you a quick walkthrough of the studio. So as you enter, there's this new table, which we're going to be using for featured battle reports and things of the like. Then we've also got all of the display cases for all of the minis that we'll be featuring in those battle reports. This is all just my personal collection. I have uh, a few mates that are going to be bringing their stuff over and we're going to flesh these cases out even further. We're going to add some Sisters of Battle. We're going to add some Grey Knights. We're going to add a whole bunch more stuff into these cases so that we can provide a really diverse range of topics. Those who have been following the blog for a while will recognize this big ass corn army. Um, and we've also got a few other things in the go. So we've got a couch here where we're going to be doing some podcast style interviews. Uh, we're going to be doing tutorials. We're going to be doing all sorts of stuff. So this is the uh, this is the new space. We've also got a liquor cabinet over here. We're going to be doing some drunk live streams, rambling sessions where we basically just get a bunch of 40k hobbyists, get them drunk, and just talk shit. So for those of you who might be in lockdowns at the moment, might be living further away from your friends that you might like, or just want to listen to some 40k banter while you're working on your hobby during the week, we're going to be doing live streams <coughs> so that you can uh, just sort of be, be involved in the conversation. Uh, so that's the, uh, the studio. Now I'm going to do a quick breakdown over what uh, we have planned for the future. And then I'm going to do, at the end of the video, will be a long-form breakdown of everything that's in these cases. So stick around for that if you're more interested and you want to see some close-ups of these minis. Uh, but yeah, let's jump straight into what we have planned for the future. Alright, one of the main things that I'm looking forward to getting back into and hitting it hard are 40k battle reports. This is something that really helped boost my channel when I first launched it and I sort of tapered off a little bit, shifted my focus more into attending tournaments and hosting and running tournaments myself. Um, but I've recently got that itch and the only thing that's going to scratch it are filming some more battle reports. So we've set up this new table which is going to be a premium space for recording. I'm going to soundproof this door so that we don't get the, uh, the noise of the, the road down the street and we're going to start filming some more battle reports here. I've got quite a few connections with Art of War down under, so we'll get some of those blokes on. We'll also get some more casual narrative style games happening as well, for those who like that. We're going to do a variety of different battle reports. Uh, but let me know in the comments below this video, what style of battle report do you prefer? Would you rather me get the high level competitive players in, get a top down camera, and really deep dive into top tier lists, top tier strategies, that sort of thing? or would you rather something a little bit more fun and casual? Uh, when, when you view battle reports, what's your preferred format? Do you like to see the top-down view of the whole game, three hour long video? Or do you prefer the half an hour snapshot summary style um, battle reports where we basically sum up each turn and explain what we did, why we did it, that sort of thing, and what the results were? So let me know in the comments below what your preferred method is. My personal preferred method for recording and editing is the turn-based summary, where I do a turn and then summarize it, and then my opponent does his turn and then we summarize it, and we only really record the summary and any like important roles and things like that. I just find that that small half an hour long video is a lot more palatable and a lot easier to digest than sitting there and watching somebody think for half an hour and try and figure out what they want to do in their turn and you're just sitting there going, oh, well, I'm bored. So that's my personal opinion, but I want to hear what you guys have to say and what you guys think because I'm not just making these battle reports to entertain myself, I'm making them to entertain you. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Also, let me know if there's any particular factions you want to see, any particular lists you want to see. Um, at the end of this video, I'm going to do a big summary of all the models that I have. So if there's a particular combination of models that I have that you'd love to see in a battle report, post the list in the comments below. 
and I'll see what I can do about uh, making that battle a reality for you. Another thing that's been a huge focus for me in the past, and I'm going to ramp it up with more video content and more blogging content on my Facebook page, uh, is tournament attendance and tournament reviews. Things like reviewing the player pack for upcoming events, then talking about the lists that I'll be taking to the event, talking about the lists that my friends are going to be taking to the event, predicting the meta, analyzing lists when they're released, and then also doing some live coverage of the event, those sorts of things. As you can see, I've attended plenty of events in my time and I've won my fair share of trophies. I'm by far not the best 40k player in the world, not even close, not even the best in my city, probably not even the best in my suburb. But I know how to get good results with certain factions by doing certain things, so I'm going to be talking about that, talking about how to read the player pack and make decisions during list building, during construction of your army that will increase your chances of being able to take home some kind of trophy to get recognition for your efforts. So I'm going to be talking about that a bit as well in the breakdowns of these player packs and of these tournaments. So I look forward to uh, sharing that with you guys. And also just an overall sort of discussion about the Victorian and the Australian Warhammer 40k tournament scene. Uh, what we're seeing, what trends are, are occurring and those sorts of things. So for those of you who might be from Melbourne but might not attend tournaments, these will give you a pretty good idea of what tournaments are like, what you can expect, and might incentivize you to pop in and join one. I also run a lot of tournaments myself, so I will be doing coverage of those as well, where I'll be talking about the lists that are attending the events that I run, I'll be doing interviews with players about their lists, I'll be doing all sorts of content. So if there's anything at all to do with tournaments in Melbourne or even Australia, because I will be attending some interstate ones, that's become a little bit more difficult with Nurgle's Rock taking over fucking you know, the world. Um, but I will be endeavouring to get some interstate stuff as well. So if you want to learn a little bit more about the tournament scene in Australia and in Melbourne, I'm going to be providing a fuck ton of content. Everything from the list to the players to the events to the venues to the terrain, everything. So I look forward to sharing that with you guys. Alright, next up we have the Bloody Oath Podcast. So this is a podcast I launched a few months back during COVID to just sort of buy the time whilst I couldn't play games. Um, its original incarnation was going to be an interview style where I was going to get players on and interview them in depth about their tactics, about their strategies, about the meta, all these sorts of things. Uh, but I've come to the realisation that there's already a shitload of that content out there and there's some really premium stuff. So I don't want to try and just be a, a lesser version or even a better version of any of that because that content already exists. So what I've decided to do is take it to the next level and create some unique content that as far as I'm aware doesn't exist anywhere else out there in the lands of YouTube and Facebook. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be talking about 40k with you about various elements of the game that aren't discussed elsewhere and ways that you can use them to improve your overall results at tournaments and things like that and also get more enjoyment out of the hobby and more satisfaction out of what you do. So these are going to be things like discussing uh, the psychological elements of the game, how to use them to get the best results you can and how to prevent other people from weaponizing psychology against you. So this goes how to deal with bullies at the tabletop, but it also goes how to read people's body language and understand, okay, if they're worried about X, Y, Z happening in the game and how that information can help you get an edge. Whereas if you're, if you're just playing the game focusing purely on yourself, you're not going to see it. So it's going to be discussing things like psychology. It's going to be discussing things like momentum, ethics, you know, when, when is it right to do certain things? How much information should you be providing your opponent? All of these sorts of things, you know, what to do in certain situations. Um, and this is coming from years and years of 40k experience. So I'll be sharing some of the times when I didn't get it right and what the outcomes were. And I'll also be sharing some of the times when I did get it right and teaching you some of the secrets that the top tier players use to give them an edge and an advantage over other players. Like you've probably noticed that net lists are a thing. So like the, the, basically the outline of the podcast will be trying to figure out and discuss 
what is it that makes some players with an insane net list perform better than others? So we're going to discuss all sorts of things like coaching and how to determine whether or not you need a coach and whether or not you get value from a coach. Um, it's going to be discussing things like momentum, how you know the better you get at the game, the easier it becomes to get even better at the game. So why it might be hard to get started in a competitive game, the more you persist with it, the better you will get. We're going to be talking about like um, a good one that I've got coming up is uh, the uh, what's it called the little fish big pond syndrome, where basically if you have a group of your gaming club and you play with them. Even if you become the best in that group, once you get to the point where you're the best in that group, you will stop getting better. You'll stop growing. So what you need to do is you need to step into a bigger pond where you're now the small fish in the big pond. And if you can survive in that environment, versing top tier players and you know, um, what, like world team championship level players, and then start beating them, you'll then start getting better and better and better. So talking about how the the people that you hang out with will determine how good you are at tournaments. And also talking about positional economics. Things like, are you a good player or are you not? Well, that's determined by who you're comparing yourself to. You know, little Timmy who's just picked up his first starter set, compared to him, you'd fucking smash him. But compared to the likes of, you know, Matt Morisoli, Jeremy Martino, the other big names in um, Victoria, Lee Abbey, those sorts of players, you might come off Sure. So, positional economics basically determines that you, you'll be good in some, be good at something depending on who you compare yourself to. So, if you want to feel good without actually pushing yourself too hard, then maybe staying in that initial pond is ideal. So, discussing the um, the process of deciding what's more important to you, being good and being the best, or just feeling content and happy with what you're doing and then using that to make informed decisions so that you'll get more satisfaction and more rewarding experiences from your hobby. So that's the sort of the idea of the Bloody Earth podcast. It's me just taking each one of these little pieces of advice and really breaking it down into detail on how it works. There's also going to be a ton of stuff in there about how to get better at the game, regardless of which direction you want to go. So just little things like operating from first principles. When you're writing a list, don't just take a net list and go, ah, oh, it's a net list, therefore it must be good. Look at each unit, figure out why each unit is good, figure out what they provide, and just walking people through how to do that. So, there's going to be a lot of information in there that's going to be great for new players, there's going to be some information that's going to be great for, you know, your B-tier players that want to step up into the A, you know, there's going to be a lot of stuff in there, so... And at the very least, hopefully there'll be some just interesting topics that we can discuss and we'll work through, you know, what you guys think and, and you guys can come back with some feedback and we can just sort of naturally just take the conversation in whichever direction we sort of feel. So I'm not going to be dictating, I'm not planning out several episodes in advance. I'll just be doing a couple episodes, then reading all the comments, I'll read every comment, and then based, based on those comments, I'll be like, oh, you know, people want to explore this topic a little bit further, they want to know this a bit more. Uh, if it's a topic that's outside of my reach, I will be getting guests on to discuss these sorts of things. Uh, it'll be sort of a philosophical lens on competitive 40k. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about things like how important passion is. You know, like if you have a, an army that you're passionate about, you're going to persist and you're going to play those games. You're going to get those reps in and you're going to become better because you've been passionate about that faction and you want that faction to do well. Whereas if you just leapfrog from one netlist to the next and the new hot faction when it comes out and then bandwagon your way around the world, you'll actually get worse results because you'll be pivoting a lot so you won't get that faction mastery and you'll also, you'll lose that emotional connection with your army, you won't care as much and as soon as you stop caring as much about the army and you just care about those fucking battle points, you'll start making silly mistakes and you'll start you'll lose momentum, you'll lose energy, you'll lose commitment, and then you'll lose games. So, talking about those sorts of things as well, Bloody Earth Podcast is going to be an absolute ripper of a, a little podcast. I hope you guys join me. And uh, I really want it to be conversational, not just a di um, dialogue, dialogue, 
It's a monologue. I don't want it to just be a monologue. So uh, hit those comments, fucking fill it with stuff. Even if it's just giving, like, have a crack at me, you know, tell me I'm an idiot. I don't care. Just fill those comments up and we will um, get a conversation going. So that's the plan there. Alrighty, and last but absolutely not least, we're going to be doing drunken 40k live streams. So I'll be getting a few mates over, we'll be kicking back on the couch, we'll have a nice bottle of whiskey with us, we've got some ancient ass codexes here, I've got a whole ton more on the way from a buy swap sell deal with some old second and third edition stuff. Um, and basically we're just going to kick back, enjoy some nice whiskey, and read some old codexes, laugh at the old rules, laugh at the old fluff, look at the pictures of the old models and be like, wow, Tyranids used to look spastic. And we'll also share some of the stories and share some of the artwork and those sorts of things. And then just basically kick back and have some conversations, have a laugh. And uh, while you're sitting at home, maybe doing some hobby, Maybe just kicking back yourself bored. Maybe even just on the drive to and from work, you can just hit play on that live stream and listen to some ridiculous cunts talk some ridiculous shit about 40k. You might learn a thing or two. For those of you who are new to the hobby, you might have started in 8th or 9th edition, hearing some of the ways that we used to play things, some of the ridiculous stuff that used to be in the game. I don't know about you, but I think that sounds like a fucking laugh. So cheers to that. Alrighty, now, as promised, for those of you who stuck around to the end of the video, I'm going to be going through all of the models that I currently have access to, and if you're interested, write a list using those models, and I'll make some battle reports. Maybe if we get two lists, I can pit them against each other. So if you guys want to write a, a list, post it in the comments below. Even just the general gist of a list that you want to see, like, say, Rhino Rush Berserkers with a Vindicator, you know, or something like that. I'll put together the lists and then we'll, I'll get some mates over and we'll do a battle report of the lists that you guys submit. Could be an interesting thing. So, uh, and if you're not interested in that, just having a look at the collection is always interesting as well. So let's go through it. We've got a shelf up here with four bloodthirsters on it. We've got a shelf here with the big daddy himself and this bloke, which is my old Scarbrand conversion before he had a model. So, no wings, two axes. That was my old scar brand. Got some objective markers down there and a Karanak. Then over on this shelf, we've got another four bloodthirsters. This one is the actual scar brand. So that means that in total, I have eight bloodthirsters and this big boy, Angrath. So that means that if you want to, I could run a battle report with eight bloodthirsters in it. And you can do it because they have three different data sheets. So you can do three Wrath of Corn, three Insensate Rage, and then two uh, Unfettered Fury. So there's options. Then we've got Charybdis, one of my favorite models in the entire game, and his little brother, the Dreadclaw. Another Charybdis and another Dreadclaw. A final Dreadclaw and a final Charybdis. So if you want to see a list where I'm dropping Charybdis bombs on cunts, that's an option as well. Next top shelf, we've got Two Keeper of Secrets and some Demonettes. This is uh, there in a list that I'll be running at a tournament next weekend, so I look forward to hitting you guys with some feedback on how they went. Now, actually I might go top to bottom instead of left to right. So we've got some Flesh Hounds here, so there's a 20 there and 20 there. No, 15, sorry. 15 and 15. So there's 30 Flesh Hounds. Next shelf down, we've got four rhinos with some corn berserkers. You'll notice that these rhinos have hatches on the front, like a Land Raider style hatch. That's a uh, commission that I got done by Tim Waggers from uh, Miniature Scenery. He sorted them out for me. And then down here, we've got a fuck ton of cultists. These are the old um, Blood Reavers from Fantasy, or from Age of Sigma, I should say. Uh, then we've got a Storm fucking eagle uh, and some obliterators old school obliterator sculpts and we've got the big dick reaver titan his finger broke off during the move which is unfortunate i'll fix that 
Uh, and I also completely forgot, I always forget, there's the Thunderhawk up here. He's too big for the cases. Next, we've got a ton of blood letters. We've got three shelves worth of blood letters. I think I've got just about 100 all up. I did lend some out recently that went missing. I think I had 120 once upon a time. Uh, then we've got some blood crushes. We've also got a few Chaos Lords on Juggernauts here. And uh, a Herald or a Blood Master or whatever the, the Skull Master. We've got more Rhinos with more Berserkers. We've got more Cultists. We've got another Storm Eagle. We've got some custom obliterators that were made up. Um, green stuff and bits and pieces and a Terminator. And then we've got some Mutilators. Please don't make me use them in a battle report because the Mutilators are gay. Uh, then we've got a uh, Renegade Knight that's got fucking shitloads of conversion work done on him. Freehand on the loin cloth. I was really happy with the way this guy turned out. And a Brass Scorpion. Next shelf, so we've done the blood letters. So then we've got this shelf here, which has got uh, my an old school jugger lord and a new school jugger lord, just for contrast in how far GW have come with their sculpts. Up the back there, we've got a Lord Disco. We've got a couple of skull cannons, which have been converted to be chariots, being held by a juggernaut instead of having that big maw on the front. We've got some corn possessed, and we've got some. Uh, these are my warband for. Um, What's the game called? Fucking Shadespire, which we had a, a good time playing that. Next shelf down, we've just got a ton of berserkers. So there's literally fucking like 80 berserkers in this case, in these cases. So that's always fun. More cultists. You'll notice that that's a bit of a theme because we've got more cultists here as well. There was a tournament where I ran 180 Alpha Legion cultists with Abaddon. That was fucking fun. Uh, <laughs> not. Uh, then we've got a couple of Land Raiders and a Vindicator, and a couple more Brass Scorpions. So there's three Brass Scorpions all up. So if you want to see them in a battle, let me know. We've got the Demon Prince shelf. So we've got Demon Prince with wings at the back there, and then two Demon Prince Sans wings. We've got my Khan the Betrayer conversion, where he's fucking ripping the guts out of these Dark Angels. Uh, I'm really happy with that. I really like the old Khan model. I'm not as big of a fan of the new one. Uh, just because I, I fell in love with the old Khan model. So when they bring out a new one, even if it is better, I still have a soft spot for the old model. Uh, not the same with Abaddon, though. The old model is fucking AIDS. The new model is fucking sex. Um, I really wish that they did the same sort of thing with Khan. You know, re-envision him in a new pose, but scale him up a bit and just make him look more imposing and more fucking savage instead of just what they did where he was like... He looks cool with his new running pose, which I actually converted this running pose well before the new model came out, so... Interesting that they took a similar design direction, but, um... Yeah. And then we've got the old Bellacore sitting here. So I will be buying the new Bellacore model when he comes out. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Then here we've got bikes, bikes for days. So there's nine corn bikes. And then that at the back there is my biker lords. I used to use them as the Cyclopia Cabal where they were all psychers. And you sort of can't see it from here, but they've all got Grey Knights impaled on their backs. So the idea was is that the Grey Knights were the ones that were the psychers, not my guys. And my guys had just impaled them and were flying around with them on bikes. Uh, more cultists, three predators and a um, what's he called? Exalted Champion. A couple of Hell Drakes for good measure. Next shelf up here, we've got more Lords. So we've got my Bloodthirster riding a fucking uh, Skull Throne. We've got a bunch of the Lords. So basically, any Chaos Lord loadout, whether it be wings and swords and axes and no wings and shields and lightning claws or fucking Terminator. Terminator with Lightning Claws, Fabius Bile, uh, Cypher, it's my Cypher conversion. We've got this boy as well, who I sometimes use as an Exalted Champion, sometimes use as Khan, depending on my mood. Next shelf down, we've got Hellbrutes. So we've got fuck loads of Hellbrutes. So there's five of the uh, Multi Melter Power Fist ones, and then two 
of the old school ones that are just dual close combat weapons. You, it's sort of hard to see through the reflections on the glass, but I've made uh, custom chain axes for these guys. Uh, and they used to have a formation where if you took three of them, it allowed them to deep strike. So I would just deep strike and multi-melter and heavy flame shit. That was always fun. It was never good, but it was fun. Uh, then we got Chosen here. So I've got a bunch of Chosen with flamers at the front here and then a ton of Chosen with melter guns at the back there. So they're good in ninth. You can outflank them. You can pop them in a Dreadclaw and they can come in and blow some shit up. And then we've got two Molothines, three Warp Smiths and then a bunch of uh, objective markers or whatever. We've got a Soul Grinder. We've got an, a Blood Slaughterer. And then we've got some more characters. So we've got a, a Combi Melter uh, Lord. We've got my big dick Lord Davros. He's got almost every weapon that a Terminator Lord has ever had access to magnetized. Even things like the old burning brand of Skelethrax, which used to be an old uh, relic, stuff like that, the Black Mace, all of that shit. Uh, another winged Lord. And then down here we have two, oh, nearly dropped it, two Lord of Skulls. Uh, yeah, and these guys can be used as either a Lord of Skulls or a Carnaton. And uh, yeah, they're cool. Next shelf. So this is where we start getting into the shelves where I've, I've recently um, expanded my collection beyond just corn. Because as you can see, I've got almost all of the corn stuff you could ever want. So I thought, well, let's expand into the other gods. So I've got these possessed here. And these possessed are painted so that they could be any Chaos God by being like a bone and flesh hybrid. Um, and that way I can use them as Nurgle possessed or Slaneshi possessed or corn possessed, whatever. Then down here we've got some Noise Marines up the back there. Noise Marines, Love and Life, and then we've got some more cultists. So these are cultists that are designed to go with any of my non-corn lists. So if I want to run Black Legion, or if I want to run Emperor's Children, or you know, anything, they can go any, any of the legions. Uh, in the same vein, this shelf has got about a thousand fucking Terminators on it. So it's got, yeah, a ridiculous numbers of Terminators here. Uh, most of them have Lightning Claws and Combi Bolters or Combi Melters. There's a few Reaper Auto Cannons in there as well. A few Combi Plasmas in there as well. Um, I plan to convert some of these back into World Eaters Red Butchers. So I'm looking for bits to make twin lightning claw terminators. I've got the forge world upgrade kit, so I'm gonna sort of butcher a couple of these into pieces and then redo them. Down here we have Zangors. So this is where we start getting into the demons and Thousand Suns allies. Uh, and again, these guys have been painted, so even though they're Zinch models, they won't look out of place if they're allied with, you know, uh, Emperor's Children Terminators, or Noise Marines, or maybe Nurgle Possessed. They'll all sort of look cohesive together on the tabletop, is the idea behind that. Then we go down here, we've got some uh, Zangor Enlightened, we've got Araman, we've got a couple Sorcerers, and a bunch of Brimstones. Uh, this bottom shelf down here, all on his lonesome, is my Angron model. He's from, uh, I believe he's from Wargame Exclusive. Ah, uh, it's a fucking sick, sick looking Angron model. Ah, back up again, so we've got the Keepers, which we've already gone through. We've got a shelf here that's just got some Lords. Up the back, you've got two Jump Pack Sorcerers. In the centre, you've got the Dark Apostle. You've got the new Khan sculpt on the side here, which I'm not a huge fan of, but he was he's cool. He's still cool. He's just not, not the uh, original. And we've also got the Master of Possession. Then we go down, we've got a tree, which I can use as a, I think it's called a Feculent Nylmore, the Nurgle tree. Uh, and then I've got a couple of more Demon Princes with wings, one with uh, talons and one with a sword. And then we've got a bunch of bikes along the front here. Then next down, we've got a shelf with fucking, what's that, five by so it's 40 and another 40, so 80 total Plague Marines. And we've got a shelf down here with these, I call them Plague Spores, but I use the rules for Nurglings for them. And it's basically, it's a Nurgling riding 
this plague spore and the narrative behind them is that that's like the first sign of a Nurgle incursion is these plague spores falling into the atmosphere and they go and corrupt. And then last, down here, and I know he's not a chaos, he's on his lonesome, is my, uh, what's it called, uh, Death Watch Knight. And it's just because he doesn't fit in the shelves that have my Death Watch at the moment, so I'm yet to still trying to figure out how I'm going to display him properly. Uh, you'll also notice that on his shield, um, he's got some funny text there. He's like, I came here to purge Xenos and fuck, and I'm all out of fucks. Alpha Titan. So he's uh, he's purging some Xenos. That's what his whole jam. Uh, yeah, pretty happy with the way he turned out. There's some freehand on his shoulder pad there, which is kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, so with the exception of that um, knight down the bottom, that is my Chaos Collection. So if you see anything in there that you want to write a list and see how it goes, maybe if there's something that you've been considering buying and, and committing to, but you want to see how it performs on the tabletop first, let me know and I'll, uh, I'll hook you up. Now we go over here to... I'll start with the Corner of Shame. Yes, I have a Tau display. Uh, so, <laughs> so along this top shelf, we've got uh, I've got two of the Sun Shark bombers. I've got the flight stands for them. They're just too tall to fit in the case if they're on them, so they're sitting down for now. Uh, a couple of the little skimmer dudes and a hammerhead. I've got three units of stealth suits and two units of five vespid, and also a happy little smiley gun drone. Then the next shelf down, we've got. Uh, Units of three uh, hazard suits. So I've got one there and then two more units over here. Then we've got uh, missile pod broadsides, a couple of commanders with fusion, and at the back there we've got a couple of, uh, what are they called, ghost keels and some random drones. Next shelf down is literally just fuckloads of drones. So there's 48 standard drones, and then there's a bunch of sniper drones as well. Now you're probably thinking, why would I have four units of drones when you can only really run three? Uh, and the answer is because then you have a couple, uh, if you want to put a couple on each unit, you have them there. And also because I went to a, a tournament, Geelong Heresy, where they replaced the rule of three with the rule of four because it was 2,500 points. So at that event, I literally brought four Riptides and four squads of drones. <laughs> and I actually won that event uh, first place overall. So uh, that was fun. That was like, I wrote it as a meme list. I'm like, this is just, I just wrote it to trigger people. <laughs> I was like, this will be funny. You know, I want to be able to kill anything. I won't kill any of their shit either because all of my damage has to come from four Riptides. But they won't kill my shit and it'll just be silly. Uh, but it ended up being fucking savage. So I... Uh, I surprised even myself with the, the damage that that list put out. Uh, anyway, down to here, we've got a fuck ton of fire warriors uh, and also a bunch of devil fish transports. I also have the turrets so that I can make them into the uh, the sky ray. Is that the one with the missiles? Um, and I've got your standard your ethereals in there, your uh, shadow suns, all that sort of stuff. And then down the bottom we have the big guys. So we've got a Storm Surge, a Riptide, Riptide, a Commander with two Flamers, which I've modeled to be fl flying, You're using the flames as his sort of flight stand. We've got a Yavara up the back there, a Yavara conversion. And we've got another two Riptides and another Storm Surge. So it's fuckloads of Tau. Um, and they were just spawned by, I'd been playing corn for years and years and years and just doing combat, combat, combat. And I was like, I want to play an army that shoots good and doesn't do combat. I want to play the opposite of what I've been playing for the last fucking hundred years. So I went with Tau. Uh, and I played them a little bit at tournaments, but uh, yeah, they're not doing so great right now. So they'll just sit there in their shelf. Uh, the next shelf, now this is, this is one of my favourite armies that I have is the uh, the Death Watch. So these I started back when um, I wanted to sort of, I wanted to play a faction that nobody else was playing. And I started thinking about first principles and like what makes a, a model good 
what makes them effective. Um, and I basically determined in my head that the most premium thing a model can have is abilities. The profile itself isn't that important. It's it, a lot of the time it's what the model can do. If it can do something other models can't, and then you can leverage that in a game, that's really powerful. So I was looking into Death Watch, and when I found that they could fall back, um, shoot something, and then charge again, I was like, that's fucking busted. I don't even care how good their shooting or combat is. The ability to just ping pong ball around the table, just fucking things up, was really interesting to me. So this was back before they got their chapter approved points update, before Storm Bolters went down, before Storm Shields went down. I started running these guys uh, and getting pretty decent results with them as well. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed these guys. And then they sort of started getting some FAQ love and some Codex love, and now they're sort of kind of everywhere. Um, but yeah, so let's go through these guys. So I've got two units of seven Hell Blasters at the top here. I've got a Smash Captain, because I used to sometimes pair them with Blood Angels. Shocker. Uh, we've got Primaris Captain there, we've got an a Ancient, and then we've got a unit of five at the back there with four Infernus Heavy Bolters, because they're fucking cool weapons. Um, then here we've got a unit of seven Terminators. Over there we've got uh, four Aggressors and three Bikes. And then in the center here we've got uh, my Jump Pack Librarian conversion. I really like these jump pack models, I don't care what anyone says, so I thought I'm going to make one of them a Libby. And then the other one is like a Smash Captain with a Storm Shield and Thunder Hammer. Uh, and then at the back there we've got the old Vendred. And then down here we've got four kill teams. So there's a few of them that are kitted out with four frag cannons and then the rest of them are Storm Shield Bolter. Four frag cannons, Storm Shield Bolter, and in the middle there we've got a Chaplain and an Apothecary at the back. Then down here we've got uh, frag, uh, what are they called, flamestorm heavy bolters, um, infernus heavy bolters, sorry, and storm shields and shit. And then over here we have the terminator squad, so that's five terminators, five veterans, a couple cyclones, a couple thunder storm shields, and that's like the big brick unit. And then we've got in here Captain, Captain Artemis and... Um, the Watchmaster. So this this guy I often use as my um, captain with Teeth of Terror because uh, he's just a sick cunt. And I actually started these guys back uh, when Kill Team was released, the um, skirmish game. And I was like, oh yeah, cool. I'll just get us one box of Death Watch veterans and make a little Kill Team. And I had so much fucking fun, like making character marines with chapter insignia and all that sort of stuff and it was just so much fun I was like fuck this I'm starting an army uh, anyway then down here we've got uh, a knight army so these are all my forge world knights so we've got two of the asherons in the corners there we've got an atropos we've got a majera and we've got a lancer so a little shelf of uh, knights down there um, I'm looking to get a few more knights like the Castellan and all that sort of stuff to flesh out the collection, but uh, at the moment that's where we're at. Uh, next shelf is Horus Heresy. A few of my mates were getting into Horus Heresy at one stage, because uh, when 8th edition first dropped and they sort of changed 40k and flipped it on its head, a few of them weren't happy and then they realised that Horus Heresy was still using the old 7th edition rules. So a few of them pivoted onto that, so I was like, oh yeah, I'll give it a go. Um, I don't play it so much anymore, but uh, there's uh, an army here for shits and gigs anyway. So we've got uh, well, all all Horus Heresy, Horus Heresy. Fuck, that's a how is that a tongue twister? Uh, anyway, Horus Heresy World Eaters. Uh, so we've got Terminators, we've got uh, Captain, we've got Big Dick Angron himself, we've got a Contemptor at the back, we've got more Terminators, more Captains. We've got some Ravagers with their big chain axes. We've got Khan, the mad lad. We've got two squads with custom Gravition cannons. Uh, we've got more Ravagers and a, what's he called, an ap Apostle. Uh, then we've got just tactical squads. So there's f six squads of five, or three squads of ten, depending on how you want to configure it. Uh, next shelf down we have Razorbacks. So 
I was actually at one stage after I sort of realized that the Horus Heresy game wasn't for me. I was going to pivot into having a loyalist space marine battle company. Um, which used to give you free transports. So the idea there was that I'd take the six squads of five and that would unlock six free Razorbacks and that was going to be cool. Uh, and then also we have the drop pods. Now I'm actually going to pull this one out because I'm really fucking happy with the, the way this drop pod turned out. Because I wanted to play around with free hands so I decided to paint a narrative onto the side of this um, drop pod. So it starts off with the World Eaters cruiser flying through the space. It arrives at a planet and bombards the shit out of it. After bombarding, the drop pods rain on the planet. And the drop pods, the space marines jump out and shoot up the place. And then that was going to be the world burning. So, not the best free hand in the world, but I'm pretty fucking happy with it. I think it looks sick as. Um, and basically, this would be the Warlord's drop pod. But yeah, so this was me just like first attempt at doing freehand, and I was like, oh, I want to have some fun with it. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. So if you want to see a drop pod style marine army, um, then that can be done with this. Uh, speaking of marine style armies, though, now we go into my... My brief stint into bandwagon jumping. So um, I'm going to be doing a few episodes of the Bloody Earth podcast about exactly why bandwagon jumping is bad. Uh, and I'll talk about my experiences with it and go through that in a bit of detail uh, and explain why it is that uh, it's not worth the effort. Uh, that being said, let's go through the list of what I have in case you guys want to see it in some battle reports. So it's, it's done in a, in a scheme that could count as any chapter. So any chapter that you guys want to see. Uh, we've got some Vanguard veterans there with Thunderhammer Storm Shield and a few Chainsword Storm Shields. We've got some characters here. So we've got a Jump Pack Librarian. We've got a Jump Pack Captain with Teeth of Terror and a Storm Shield. And we've got a Jump Pack Chaplain. Uh, so these were, I used to run them as Raven Guard and get decent results with them. Uh, then down here we've got some uh, Eliminators or Space Marine Snipers down the back there. Uh, two squads of uh, Inceptors with Heavy Bolters. A squad of five Terminators and a Leviathan. And then three Repulsors. Next shelf is just fuckloads of scouts. I think there's six or seven units of six scouts. I could be wrong, but lots of uh, lots of snipers. A couple of close combat ones as well. Then we've got a unit of ten intercessors and some more characters. So we've got like, a, what's he called? A chapter master, a primaris lieutenant, a normal Libby, and an apothecary. Then down here we've got three attack bikes and a captain on bike. And this was my uh, one of my favourite tricks was, and I'll discuss this in the Bloody Earth podcast in detail, but creating unassuming models. So like you look at him there, and he looks pretty basic, he's just a biker. But if you look at him on this side, you're like, holy shit, he's got a thunder hammer and a storm shield. So this, and I, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't ever do this again. But it's an idea that's worth discussing and worth people understanding is that uh, don't just look at a model and if it doesn't look imposing, dismiss it. Because if you don't look, if you look at him, he looks un unimportant and you'll dismiss him, but he'll actually fuck your shit up. So this is one of the traps that people fall into where their models look really unassuming and you can get caught out by it. So make sure you fully understand what everything can do. Anyway, a uh, bunch of aggressors, with some with Flamestorm, some with Auto Bolt launchers. Land Raider and a fucking Storm Talon, and some objective markers down there. Then down here we've got a Whirlwind, and my favourite fucking model in my collection at the moment is my Falchion. I fucking love this thing. It's such an epic tank. Um... 
I ran that with the ironstone <laughs> and the um the the guy that can heal six wounds a turn and people just couldn't fucking kill it. <laughs> it was so good. Uh anyway, uh a bunch of centurions and this ties into what I was saying about don't chase the bandwagon because you'll end up putting a ton of time and effort into a model. You'll end up buying a bunch of them, spending a bunch of money, and then they'll get FAQ'd into the dirt, and you'll be upset. So, that's my... This shelf is my reminder never to chase the meta again. Uh, and this one also is as well. So, these are my Thunderfire Cannon conversions and my Ferios Iron Father guy. I'm actually pretty happy with these little... Um, Thunderfire cannons. It's just like an Avenger Gatling cannon on tank tracks, but <laughs> yeah That was I, just, I needed Thunderfires. They were sold out everywhere. Couldn't find them. I needed them for an upcoming tournament so I just raided the bits box and Put together what I could so like you've got the the top half bit. That's a hunter killer missile casing The back of them is a hatch from a rhino The tank tracks are the tank tracks that weren't used on this guy because it comes with a Bane blade kit as the base so these are tank tracks off a Bane Blade. That plate over there is a um, piece of an Aegis defense line. <laughs> and then these bits are off Defilers. Like, it's just a little hod hodgepodge of a model. But uh, I think they look fucking sick. Anyway, next shelf up, we've got a bunch of Incursors. And then the shelf above that is Incursors and Infiltrators. So that's the Space Marine collection. Um... So if you want to see Space Marines on the tabletop, that's what we have access to. And I'll finish it off by just doing a quick rundown of the trophies that I've got and a quick story on those for those who might be interested. So we've got, and this is in no particular order, we've got the Mensa Open from 2016, third place overall. This was actually quite early in the piece when I first was sort of starting to go to tournaments. Uh, we've got a medal from the Mensa Masquerade. I think this is a player's choice. Uh, third place best presented. So you can see that while my army isn't perfectly painted, I know how to get those best presented awards. So I will be going through that with you guys, teaching you some tips and tricks on how to make your army seem better than it actually is. Uh, we've got the 2017 champion for the Mensa Open. So the following year, came third overall one year then the next year first place overall uh, and then we've got another Mensa Masquerade so the Mensa Masquerade is one of my favorite events to go to uh, and that one was the TO's choice of best presented I believe that was the year that I ran um, the Falchion but it could have been or it might have been the year that I ran the Death Watch I'm not sure uh, then we've got here, Mensa Open 2016 Player's Choice, and a first place at an RTT for Adeptus Victorium there. Um, that Player's Choice I won with, so 2016, which was the year that I came third overall as well, was my Cyclopia Cabal Death Star with all the Flesh Hounds. That was that year. Uh, then up here we've got... Um, ATC, so I've been part of the Victorian ATC team, uh, which for those of you who don't know, basically there's a team event held in Australia every year where each state puts together a team of their eight best players and duke it out to see which state is the best. Um, I've participated in it since 2017, every single year. So 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, so five years. Um, I was captain last year, however, unfortunately, due to COVID, we didn't even get to play, which was a shame. Um, but yeah, so we came second in 2017, then 2018, we came third. No, 2018, we came first, then 2019, we came third, and then 2020, it didn't run, and now we're going into 2021, so... Yeah, so that's exciting. There's some of my most prized possessions of these trophies here because they uh, they mean so much more than just a singles trophy because it's the team banding together, working together, and that cooperative effort 
is so rewarding. I'm a huge fan of um, team events. Uh, next, we're going to go into some Black Crusade. So, Black Crusade is a narrative um, event that uh, Jared Briat runs, where often the missions are a little bit on the janky side, and he does various narrative-focused stuff throughout the event, which is a fuck ton of fun. Uh, so, I got third place battle at one of them, first place best overall at one of them, and there's a couple more trophies up here. So that one's uh, another first place best general, no, best overall, so that was the first place overall. And then the same year, I got highest battle points. So the Black Crusade has been a, a really good event for me, I've got really good results at those. Uh, then we go into this, the Draft 2, best overall. So that draft was similar and it used the open play cards. So basically what happened, or a variant of the open play cards, where basically you and your opponent would roll off and then you would take turns eliminating options until you ended up with one deployment, one mission, and one twist. And the twists would be things like all invulnerable saves are decreased by one, you know, or something like that. So not your straightforward 40k but it was really good fun and it, it made for some exciting um some games that one then we got these guys this is the uh geelong heresy where i got uh the overall winner and second place general uh, i think i think it's um i actually got first place general but because i got the overall winner they passed the first placed award on to the next person so that I didn't walk away with all of the trophies because I'm pretty sure I was the only undefeated player. Um, which is why I won that. Yeah, anyway, that's irrelevant. That's the, the one when I took the four squads of drones and the four riptides. And then lucky last, but absolutely not least, even though it's one of the poxiest trophies, this is my TO's choice from EastCon 2015. That's actually the first trophy that I ever won for Warhammer 40k. Um, and it's one of the main reasons that I pivoted so hard into attending tournaments and not so much on the hobby side because I was so fucking stoked and blown away because it was actually the first tournament I ever attended. So I'd heard of it, I'd heard of Warhammer tournaments, but I'd never really attended any before. One of my mates was heading down to it, and he's like, just come, man, just come, you'll love it. And I'm like, all right, fuck it, I'll come. Um, and I brought my army down, and I put a ton of effort into preparing it. I'd never been to a tournament before, so I didn't know what to expect. So um, I put a ton of effort in, and it was rewarded, and it was a great feeling, and I haven't looked back ever since. I've been hitting the tournament scene hard ever since. Um, so yeah, that sort of sums up everything that we have in all of these cases available. Um, so yeah, let me know what you think. Let me know if there's anything you want to see in battle reports. Let me know if there's anything in there that you found particularly interesting that you'd like to see me expand those collections on. Like, do you want to see bigger Death Watch battles? Do you want to see bigger Space Marine battles? Um, worth noting, I do also have a Grey Knight army which I share with a friend where basically he buys the models, I build and paint them, and we both own it equally. Um, but it's out at the moment, he's using it for tournaments. So that will eventually be coming in here. I'll be clearing some space on some of these shelves and putting in a Grey Knights army. And then also one of my mates has got me to commission paint a Space Rain army for him, which is about the same size as mine. Um, and we agreed to paint it in the same scheme as mine with the same methods and that way we can borrow each other's models and it'll be all cohesive as one big force so there's a whole fuckload more space marines coming in to this collection to really fucking expand it so i'll we'll probably end up condensing all these trophies or getting a new case for the trophies and um really opening up on these space marines so that's it going to be exciting as well so yeah, with that, uh, with that being said, let me know, one of the main things that I want to know in this video is of the various um, types of content that we've got coming out, the podcast, the drunken live streams, the battle reports, the hobby tutorials, the tournament coverage, of all of the various uh, 
content that I have planned for you guys, what are you the most excited about? And are there any other types of content that you'd like to see more of? Let me know and let's grow this, uh, this channel. Let's get it back to its former glory and let's, uh, let's have some fucking fun with it, eh? All right. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I will fucking talk to you next time. Cheers. Long for the blood, y'all.